Good evening. We have two big conversations lined up for you tonight on The Last Word. Both of them in context to battling terrorism. The first one about global terrorism, about our fight to get the sanctions against Masood Azhar. The second one about fighting Maoist terror within our own country. So let's begin with Masood Azhar. Today, the United Nations Security Council finally approved and designated Masood Azhar, the jaish e chief, one of the most dreaded and wanted terrorists for India. They have designated him as a global terrorist. This has happened because finally China agreed to withdraw its objection to this proposal. It has been a 10 long year fight for India and it has taken place today. Now, over the course of next few minutes, we will explain to you why it is important. What does this really mean? But here are five basic pointers of why I believe that this development that has taken place today is a significant development. Of course, the first point on that is what does it really do? We have been fighting this battle for 10 years, since 2009. Four different proposals were moved. Of course, the last one was actually moved by US, UK and France. So we got world support building up for this. And finally, this has happened. Point number two on why what we're talking about today is so important. He is the mastermind of several big attacks for spreading terror in our country while sitting comfortably in Pakistan. Right from the parliament attacks in 2001 to the 26-11, to the Pathan court attack and the most recent one, the Pulwama attack. Let's go on and tell you why else we believe this is a very important thing because what happens now is that all assets, all financial assets, all bank accounts of this man and those linked to him will be frozen. So money supply will be choked to this terrorist, which is a very, very big one. We'll move on and get you point number four now. This will also boost India's fight against terrorism, the whole fight against terrorism campaign that we have. We've been leading it from the forefront, even at United Nations. And this will give us a boost. It's literally a win for the country on a global platform like that. Broadly, these are the points that we've collated together. Uh, there's one more on this uh, that tells you that not just India, but US, UK, France have now also understood the importance of fighting men like Masood Azhar and cracking down on him, which will further build uh, pressure, hopefully, on Pakistan. But does this really help? And there are two aspects to this. There are two different arguments that we have collated. And uh, before we go to our guests, here is the one set of argument. Does it really help? Like I said, the first one is yes, it does help because all his assets, bank accounts will now be frozen. We'll go on to the next one about the impact. Now, once you are designated as a global terrorist by the UNSC, all countries who are UN members must prevent the terrorist travel. So they cannot allow him to enter, to exit, to travel through their own territories. That's the other rule that must be implemented. And there's a third part to this. Once you've been designated as a global terrorist, then all support systems to you, all kinds of arms, weapons, equipment, infrastructure, training, technical advice, all of that cannot be given directly or indirectly. Of course, it now depends on how much each country follows that. Which brings me to the other side of this argument of does it help? Many say there is no big impact of sanctions on the other terrorists that we've seen. This is not the first one who's been included in that list of designated global terrorists and there's not been a significant impact. For example, uh, there are two big names that actually pop up, Hafiz Saeed and Daoud Ibrahim. Both of them are on the UN terrorist list. But both of them continue to function, move around, their businesses thrive. Hafiz Said still is part of massive terror plots that are carried out. None of them are really in jail. Once in a while, maybe uh, they, they put some of them in temporary house arrest and then that's that. So those are the two sides of the argument. Let's get our experts in and say good evening to Maru Fraza, strategic affairs expert and a consulting editor to the Times Network. Vivek Kachu, former Secretary for Ministry of External Affairs. Great to have both of you on this panel. I also have Talmi Zahmad, former diplomat. Thank you so much, Mr. Zahmad, for joining us. Uh, Maruf, I'm going to begin with you. What does this really mean for a layman to understand when yeah. we say that the UN has now designated him as a global terrorist? What happens? 
Well, you know, Tanvi, uh, there are uh, several important things that will flow from this UN, uh, finally the UN Security Council designating him as a terrorist. The first is that the international community and the largely influential Western countries have formally now acknowledged that they are on India's side on India's battle against terrorism, largely sponsored from Pakistan and its territories. Earlier, I cannot recall anybody coming out so openly and so aggressively to support the Indian stance, particularly when a country as powerful as China has been backing Pakistan on this issue as on every other issue. But what we need to also understand is that the turnaround, to my mind, has taken place after the Balakot strikes, when the world realized that India is not going to come back to us every time with reams and reams of information and ask them to declare this Masood Azhar or Pakistan as sponsors of terrorism or terrorists per se, because now India was willing to fight its own battles. And that is when the world has decided to stand up with us. The second and most important thing to me is that by designating him as such, the Pakistani military establishment is now cornered. They have humored and harbored him for so many years. They now have to take a call. Are they, are they going to stick with the man who has skeletons in their cupboards and knows of the skeletons of what are in their cupboards? And are, is he going to come out in the open and feel pressurized to speak against them? Mm. Because the FATF and the bodies that are looking at sanctioning Pakistan financially need all this evidence to nail Pakistan further and not release the funds that Pakistan desperately needs. And that is the economic squeeze that India has been working towards. Okay. And thirdly and most importantly, the lesson for us is that when you are on the right side and when you take up a consistent stand diplomatically, even countries like China are shown the door and have to fall in line with world opinion and we cannot be browbeaten by them. Okay, all right. Point taken. Uh, Maru says that, that we will not be browbeaten by them and this shows that even countries like China will bow down. Uh, Mr. Viveka, if I can come to you on that, I expect. Where do you think the turning point really took place? Do you agree when Maru says that Balakot strikes perhaps was it because... If, actually, if you see the timeline, after that, there was a proposal that France made, uh, which was taken up by UN and China, vetoed it again. But somehow in the last one month, something seems to have worked for China to give in. I think the Balakot strike demonstrated that India's doctrine on handling Pakistan and Pakistani terror was changing significantly. Whereas in the past, India was trying to handle Pakistani terror through diplomatic means and through management of its own political opinion. After it began, after the Uri strike, uh, that was the surgical strikes, but really after Balakot, we enunciated a new doctrine. The Foreign Secretary said basically that we had seen preparations in Pakistan for a major strike and since Pakistan was not acting therefore we acted in a preemptive manner and it is well known that all countries have the right to self-defense to take action in a preemptive manner so we were telling the world that we will now take kinetic action in Pakistan and hence provocation began with preparations for a terrorist strike and that escalation began with this. Now, there is a point here which needs to be understood. Pakistan has, since 1998, since the nuclear tests, propagating that it is very dangerous for India to react through its conventional forces, to react kinetically to a terrorist attack because both countries have nuclear weapons and in this nuclear overhang, as they call it, if there can be action-reaction leading to an escalation. India said that escalation does not begin with an Indian response, but with Balakot it demonstrated that escalation begins 
with the preparations for a terrorist strike and a terrorist strike. Right. Hence, the world is now telling Pakistan through this Masood Azhar uh, banning and listing that it is much too dangerous for Pakistan to play these games because India is not willing to accept Pakistani terror anymore. And this is important. My last sentence. As long as a country accepts a terror, handles it only diplomatically and politically, the world really pats it on the back and says, you are being very responsible, you are being good boys. It is only when you take determined armed action that the focus of the world changes and turns to the perpetrator. Mm. And that is the most significant aspect after Balakot. Okay. And I read what has happened today in this, as part of the same process. All right. Uh, so, so both of our uh, you know, our first two speakers have said that the impact of our action has now made the world realize that perhaps uh, they too need to wake up and get together in this fight. Um, so tell me, Zahmad, uh, do you agree? And also, do you think somehow what's happened in the last uh, a week ago in this region, in Sri Lanka, also has a bearing somewhere because uh, nobody wants a bigger unstable region, not even China, and an attack in Sri Lanka uh, hits closer to home even for China. I'm afraid we are taking a very short-sighted view. India has been attacked, uh, has been attacked by terrorism for 30 years. We had the attack on our parliament in 2001. We had the Mumbai attack in 2008. What did the international community do during this entire uh, period? The United States has been a very strong supporter of Pakistan in spite of all these actions. I think what has changed is something that is happening in Washington, D.C. And that is Washington desperately wants India to be on board in respect of their policies against Iran. They need this desperately. But India asserts the right of strategic autonomy. India believes that every position that it takes has to be in its own national interest. What has this UN resolution really achieved for us on the ground? Very little. Mm. The world knows that Jaish e Mohammed is a terrorist organization. It is a self confessed terrorist organization. They are the ones who took credit for the attack at Pulwana. We don't need anything new. We have already shown Pakistan and the international community that we will not tolerate these attacks upon us. I'm not sure that anything significant has changed on the ground. We should remember that the United States still has a robust relationship with Pakistan. It is working closely with Pakistan with regard to the Afghan scenario. In the past also, the United Nations has issued resolutions against various entities and individuals. It has had no impact whatsoever. What we really need, and that is where I would look to the international community with deep skepticism, what we really need is Pakistan to declare effectively that it will no longer use terror as part of state policy against India. Okay, uh, so how do we get Pakistan to do that? Because fact of the matter is, uh, uh, after the uh, Uri, the surgical strike that we carried out, uh, after that, the Balakot strike that we carried out, it, despite that, Hafiz Saeed is still alive and kicking and functional. Masood Azhar is still alive and kicking and functional. Yes, Maruf, I'm bringing that question to you only. The fact of the matter is U.S. still has relations uh, with Pakistan. China still has relations with Pakistan. So what changes on ground with this? Well, you know, Tanvi, the fact is that uh, U.S. may have relations with Pakistan, but they are certainly nowhere near as honky-dory as they were several years ago when the U.S. was clearly more and more dependent on Pakistan for a variety of reasons. And they were also buying Pakistan's bluff and lies. I mean, the Trump regime began to turn the corner in terms of making admissions publicly that they have been funding Pakistan foolishly and words to that effect. But the fact of the matter is that while I respect Mr. Talmiz Ahmed a lot, I do not agree with many of his... Uh, uh, you know, uh, claims today, because this, though it appears symbolic, just like the declaration against Hafiz Saeed was symbolic, but that is what I brought out as the second point. The challenge is for us now, 
how do we bring to bear the squeeze on Pakistan? So it is not end game in dealing with Pakistan and their sponsorship of terror. And I think it's expecting too much to think that Pakistan is going to come out and publicly proclaim Correct. that they're abandoning all these guys who have been humored and kept as an extended arm of the state of Pakistan and the deep state of Pakistan because there are just too many linkages and more importantly, a point that very few people discuss, that the Pakistani military and security establishment doesn't have the wherewithal now to confront all these monsters who are romping around the state of Pakistan. Correct. I mean, one assumption says, and there are intelligence reports to that effect, that more than half the size of the Pakistan army are armed people and armed groups that operate in Pakistan. And they possibly just cannot be put down by the Pakistan army and they will not abandon terror unless they get a better deal somewhere, such as some of the Hafiz Saeed and their cronies who were trying to be, who are trying, the Pakistan was trying to legitimize them by getting them into the political process with the last elections when Imran Khan came as prime minister. But this is a long drawn out process. We need to bring to bear the economic squeeze on Pakistan and that will become strengthened now with now Pakistan having very little to uh, sort of uh, evade the FATF and the other groups that are putting pressure on Pakistan to come clean on terrorism because this man who was sitting on one of the most lethal terror organizations and as Mr. Ahmed rightly said, a self-confessed terror organization was not being declared a terrorist. So while it's bizarre, and I've always said so, that how can you have a democracy and a leader who's not recognized as a Democrat to be a leader of a democracy? And that was, I mean, it's a strange analogy to draw, but if this is precisely the case, that you had a full terrorist organization, but the leader was not being declared a terrorist. Now, what it also proves to us, and I think we need to build up on that, that we don't need to allow China to get away with all kind of pressure tactics they bring to bear to us, on us, directly and indirectly through Pakistan and other international initiatives. Mr. Ahmed is right to say that the Americans need us, but also this m initiative against Masood Azhar at the UN Security Council was moved by France yes. and not just by the US. Yes. So France is an active supporter of India. France does see merit in India's point of view. And all this has begun to change primarily because they have seen India now willing to take responsibility, as Mr. Karju said, by using military power to further its diplomatic agenda. Just by doing one of the two, you will not achieve enough. You okay. have to have a comprehensive strategy for dealing with Pakistan. And what was missing was the military element. And that's coming to play after Balakot. All right. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, to all of you for joining us. I wish we had more time, but it's been a, 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 a very news-heavy day. And while uh, this, is a, uh, this is a piece of good news that has come, that we've moved one step closer and had one victory in a fight against terrorism, the fact of the matter is this is on a global platform. There are still many, many challenges to go. One on the aspect of uh, fighting international terrorism and terrorism that emanates directly from Pakistan. Even Pakistan's statement today after this development is half of it is complete denial of the reality blame game rake up kashmir add few other things which is the usual rhetoric and then say but okay we will do what the un is asking us to do because we are either any any which way is doing that which is an absolute lie and a sham so can this pressure continue can we build further pressure can us and china and india ensure that Sponsors of terrorism, countries like Pakistan, do not get away with this so that we don't have any more of attacks like we saw in Pathan Court, like we saw here in Mumbai in 2611, or like we saw in Pulwama just a few months ago. That's part number one.